Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture on 3D computer vision and today we are going to talk about single view metrology. Hopefully by the end of today's lecture you will be able to describe the action of camera projection on planes, lines, conics as well as quadric and you will be able to explain the respective effects of fixed camera center, increased focal length and pure rotation on the image. And we'll look at how to calibrate the intrinsics of a camera with the image of absolute conics. Finally, we'll look at the definition of vanishing points and vanishing line and use them to find the geometric properties of the scene and camera. And of course, I didn't invent any of today's material. I took most of the content of today's lecture from the textbook written by Richard Hartley and Andrew Zizerman, Multi-View Geometry in Computer Vision, in particular, Chapter 8. I strongly encourage every one of you to take a look at this chapter after today's lecture. So just a quick recap of what we have done uh, last week. We basically uh, described the characteristic of a projective camera based on a simple pinhole camera model. And we default the projection matrix. So this is essentially a 3 by 4 matrix. We have looked at the, its action on a, a point. In particular, we have looked at how it uh, transforms a point in forward projection. That means that given in a 3D point in the real scene, we have looked at how this camera projection matrix, which you denote as P, map this into the image. So this is what we call the forward projection. Given a point on the, on, on the 2D image, we have looked at how to make use of the projection matrix to back project this particular point onto a light ray. And today, we'll continue to look at the action of the camera projection matrix on other entities such as plane, lines, conics, and uh, quadric. In particular, we'll look at the forward and backward projection uh, properties of uh, these entities from a camera projection uh, matrix. Let's first look at the action of the projective camera on 3D planes. So suppose that we have a 3D plane uh, in the world, which we call pi. Now let's first assign the world uh, coordinate frame that define this particular uh, 3D plane. In, in fact, we have looked at this in last lecture uh, during camera calibration. A convenient way to assign the world coordinate onto a 3D plane would be to place the XY plane of the world frame. So this is the world frame over here. Uh, we are going to align the XY plane onto the 3D plane pi itself, such that the 3D coordinates of any point, let's call x pi over here, that lies on the plane can be rewritten as uh, x, y, 0, 1. Uh, 0 here is because of the uh, x, y plane lying on the plane. So there's no value for the z axis. And, and if we were to expand this particular expression, the um, metric multiplication here, we can see that basically the zero in, in this 3D coordinates of this particular point on the plane acts on P3, the third column of the camera projection, hence eliminating it. So as a result, we can rewrite this particular expression over here with just P1, P2, and P4. This is uh, the first, second, and fourth column of the uh, camera projection matrix multiplied by x, y, and 1. We can ignore the z-axis because it's always 0. Since we eliminated P3 of the 3D point on the plane, which we call x pi over here, we can see that the end result would be simply a homography between the 2D point and the 3D point on the plane. So the reason is because now we have the same dimension. Small x over here is actually x, y, and 1, the homogeneous coordinates. And since we remove the z-axis here, we will also have a 3 by 1 uh, matrix over here. And these two entities, the 2D and 3D entity, are, are simply related by a 3 by 3 homography matrix, which is given by the first column, second column, and the last column of the camera projection uh, matrix. It also becomes obvious that since we have two planes, the image plane as well as the world plane is uh, x pi over here. We have looked at in lecture three that the homograph that relates these two planes can be easily found from four point, any four point correspondences on the image and the world plane. Now let's look at the action of the camera projection on 3D lines. So suppose that we are given a 3D line which we call capital L. We can see that uh, geometrically, 
when a line is being projected onto a camera center, which this uh, plane over here has the image plane, the projection of the 3D line forms a plane, which is this guy over here. It forms a plane because this is uh, projected onto the camera center. And let's denote this particular projection, the plane uh, that is formed by the projection of this 3D line L over here as pi. And the intersection of this plane, pi, uh, with the image plane would form the forward projection of the 3D line onto the 2D image, which we denote as uh, small l over here. Now, uh, let's formulate this in a more mathematical way. Suppose that we are given two 3D uh, points in the space that lies on the 3D line L. So we have A and B over here that lies on the 3D line L. And we, we can then define the whole family of points that lies on this 3D line L as a span by the 2D points A and B. So we can simply write X mu, which is uh, one family of uh, uh, solution points over here, uh, X mu, that, that simply equals to A, which is the first point plus mu uh, B. And that means that X could be any point that is lying on this particular uh, 3D line over here. We can simply make use of this uh, equation over here to represent the, the 3D line L. And let's look how the camera projection uh, matrix P would act on this particular uh, 3D line over here. Because we know that uh, given a point uh, in 3D, which we call X, the camera projection simply, uh, it's a multiplication by the 3D point X that will give rise to the particular uh, image point over here. So this is capital X and this is small x. Well, the P would pro forward project this particular 3D point onto the, the image. And since we have defined the whole family of points that sits on the 3D line over here, we can also directly make use of the, this relation over here on uh, the whole family of points. So uh, I would have a end result of the whole family uh, parameterized by the same parameter mu over here. But now this would be the whole family of points that is sitting on the projection of this 3D line on the image. And this would be simply equals to the P multiplied by the big X, which is also parameterized by mu over here. What, so what this simply means is that I'm taking every point that is sitting on the 3D line and project it onto the 2D image via the camera projection matrix P. And we can evaluate this in two, uh, we'll simply uh, take this equation over here, where every point on the line is spanned by A plus mu B. So we can substitute this A plus mu B into the equation. As a result, we can see that this expands to two terms, mu P and B. So this becomes the projection of the point A onto the 2D image, which we can rewrite this at small a over here, in terms of the notations to be com consistent, we are projecting a capital X, which represents the 3D point onto the 2D image point, uh, which we denote by small x over here. We are now similarly projecting a capital A, denoting the 3D points on the line, and we are projecting it onto a small a over here, which is 2D image point. So we can rewrite this PA as small a, Plus, so mu remains because it's a parameter that parameterizes the span over the line. So mu here remains, and we can see that there's this term over here, p multiplied by b, which will follow the same convention. This simply means it's a projection of the 3D point, which we denote by capital B onto the 2D image, which we denote by small b. And this is this particular equation. After the projection, it will be simply the family of 2D points that sits on this 2D lines, which corresponds to the projection of L under the camera projection matrix P. Now, given a 2D line, let's look at the backward projection of this 2D line. We are given this line here, which we denote as small l over here. And we'll look at the back projection of this particular line uh, by the camera matrix P, because we know that the camera projection matrix here is actually a three by four matrix. So what it means here is that this particular metric here, it has a maximum rank of three. 
if this is an infinite camera, a finite camera, which we have looked at uh, last week, this wouldn't be rank 3. It would be actually only rank 2. But in this case, you are only talking about the projective camera where the rank of P is at most 3 because it's a non-square metric. What it simply means here is that the inverse of P doesn't exist. Hence, we cannot re directly recover the 3D line from the inverse of this small L over here. Let's also look at the geometric intuition behind this rank deficiency. We can see that when we project this particular 2D line on the image back into the 3D space, we'll get a plane that looks something like this that we denote by pi. And what happens here is that in addition to the original line that created this particular projection, small l over here, uh, we can also have a whole family of lines. As long as it sits on this particular plane pi, we can see that this line here will do a forward projection onto the same 2D image over here. Similarly, we, if we have a line here, you will also forward project to the same line. This means that uh, what we get here by doing a back projection is a whole set of solutions that is denoted by the plane, which is the projection of this particular 3D line onto the 2D image. We'll see later that uh, this particular projection, a uh, plane, it's actually given by this particular equation, which is equals to pi equals to P transpose of L. Now let's look at the proof of why pi is equals to P transpose of L. So pi here is this particular plane of the projection of this line, which we denote by L, onto the 2D space by the camera projection matrix P. We know that a point which we denote by a uh, small x over here, it sits on the line uh, which we denote by L on the image if and only if the dot product of x and L equals to zero. So we have seen this relation in lecture one. We also know that the corresponding point that sits on the 3D line, capital L, uh, at the point, this 3D point which we denote by capital X over here, it's going to map onto the image that corresponds to this small x over here via the equation that we have looked at uh, many times since last lecture, P multiplied by capital X. So if we were to substitute this relation back onto this here, we can see that it simply means that we have this equation P of X transpose multiplied by L equals to zero. And the transpose here would be simply evaluated as X transpose P transpose and L equals to zero, which basically can be used to redefine the back projection where P transpose L here can be taken as a plane. So we know that a point has to sit on the plane if and only if the dot product of these two equals to zero. Hence, this particular plane here, which we denote by pi, must be equals to P transpose multiplied by L, which is the dot product of our camera projection matrix and the 2D line. Now let's look at the action of the projection matrix on conics. We'll first look at the back projection of a conics under the camera matrix P. And we can see that given a conics on the image, might look something like this. So intuitively or geometrically, we can see that if we were to reproject uh, any point that lies on this particular conic, which we denote as C over here on the image, and this is the camera center, which is also C, but this is a, a vector. And this conic here is actually a matrix, which is used a bow face C to represent the camera location. And we can see that any point that lie on this particular conic is back projected to be a ray in 3D space. So if we were to take all the points that lies on the conics and start to reproject them into the 3D space, we'll essentially get a, a cone shape. We have seen in lecture two that a cone is essentially a degenerate quadrix. So this guy here is actually a four by four matrix that does not have a full rank. This means that uh, this is actually a degenerate quadric. And C over here, it's our three by three conics that lies on the image uh, plane. And we'll see that this particular cone over here, the back projection of the conics into a cone in, uh, in 3D space is given by P transpose C multiplied by P, where P here is our camera uh, projection matrix that we have looked at 
we'll also see that the camera center, which we denote by bow face C over here, it's essentially the null space uh, of this particular cone, since it's the vertex of the cone. This means that every light ray that run, runs through this particular cone over here, it must converge at the center of projection, which is the camera center. And what this essentially means is that we would have this particular equation, Q of CO, the cone, multiplied by C, it would be equals to zero, since C must lie in the null space of the 3D cone. And the proof is this. Suppose that we have point X, which calls small x over here. So suppose that we have a conic, which we call C, and we have a point that is uh, we call small x over here. And we know that this particular point, small x, lies on the conic C, if and only if this equation holds true. That is the quadratic equation of a conic that we have defined in uh, lecture one. That means that x transpose uh, C, uh, x must be equals to zero. If this is fulfilled, that means the point of small x actually lies on this particular 2, 2D conic, which we denote by C over here. We also know that uh, from the camera projection, uh, big X, the corresponding 3D point, it maps to the 2D image, small x over here, via this projection function that we have seen many times, uh, P multiplied by x. So essentially, this guy here is equals to small x. And which means that I'm projecting the big X, the 3D point here, onto the 2D image via the camera uh, projection matrix. Now, uh, we, we have two equations over here. We can substitute this small x, the reprojected point via the camera matrix, into this particular equation, which says that the reprojected point of the 3D point, uh, capital X, uh, which we denote by small x, must lie on the conic in, on the image. So if we were to substitute this small x into this guy over here, we can see that uh, we will get px transpose c multiplied by p of x equals to zero, which can be further evaluated as x transpose p transpose c multiplied by px equals to zero, which is essentially this particular equation over here. And what's interesting here is that since we have now transformed this particular conic equation in terms of the geometric entities on the 2D image space, in the 3D world space, and we can see that this essentially would be equivalent to a quadric equation that says that capital X over here must be lying on a quadric entity which is given by P transpose C multiplied by P. And hence, we can take this particular entity over here, P transpose multiplied by P as a quadric. And geometrically, we have seen that this particular quadric here is equivalent to a cone that is formed from the back projection of the 2D conics into the 3D space. And hence, this completed our proof that a 2D conics is actually uh, back projected into the 3D space as a degenerate uh, 3D cone by this particular equation here, P transpose multiplied by C multiplied by P. Let's say this is the image over here. So there's a conix over here, the camera center. It backs projects to this cone, which is given by QC0 equals to P transpose of uh, C, P transpose. We can see that geometrically because the camera center is the vertex of this particular cone over here. Hence, it actually lies in the null space of the quadric. And hence, this equation, QCO multiplied by C, which is the camera center, uh, must be equals to zero, since C is on the vertex of the cone, which means that it lies in the null space of degenerate quadric over here. And we can rewrite this equation into what we have seen earlier on, which is P transpose of C multiplied by P, uh, and now multiplied by C equals to zero. And we can see from this particular equation here, this indeed equals to the null space, because we have looked at P multiplied by C, this is the projection of the camera center, is equals to zero from uh, our definition of a camera center in last week's lecture. So let's look at an example, uh, how to express this uh, formulation of the back projection of a conic into a degenerate quadric, which is a cone. So suppose that we have a camera projection matrix that is equals to K 
multiply by identity over here. This guy here is a 3 by 4 matrix and this is our camera intrinsics. This is actually our extrinsics. And this intrinsics is actually a 3 by 3 uh, matrix. So this is in a canonical frame. That means that uh, since we have an identity as the extrinsics over here, what this simply means is that the world frame is aligned with the camera coordinate frame. And then, given this particular projection matrix, a, co a conic on a 2D image, which we denote by C over here, it actually backs projects to a cone, which is given by uh, Q of CO equals to P transpose C multiplied by P. So we can see that if we were to take the transpose of this guy over here, it's equals to K transpose and zero uh, transpose multiplied by C and multiplied by P over here. So we will get this equation. You can see very clearly that this particular 4 by 4 uh, matrix is less than full rank. And the reason is pretty obvious from here because we have the last row as well as the last column that contains uh, only zeros. And hence this shows that QCO is a degenerate quadric, which is essentially a cone. This example shows us that the cone here is a degenerate quadric. Now let's also look at what's the effect of the camera projection matrix on other smooth surfaces. So suppose that we are given any arbitrary smooth surface, which we denote as S over here. Uh, an example is this particular shape over here. It's an arbitrary uh, shape that consists of uh, smooth surfaces. We can see that the projection of this particular smooth surface, which we call S over here, it's going to be projected onto an image with central projection such that the outline or the contour of this particular uh, image over here, it's going to be forward projected onto the 2D image plane. And we, we can also see geometrically that every point uh, that intersects the this particular light ray over here is actually defined by the light ray that is tangent to the smooth surface and passes through the camera center. So just now we have looked at, in this case here, tangent to the smooth surface. This is actually our forward uh, projection because we are projecting a 3D entity onto a 2D. So this is uh, from P3 space, we project to uh, P2 space. And similarly, for backward projection, we can see that if we were to join a line from the camera center to the tangent of this surface over here. This would define our back projection of this contour that is given on the 2D image over here. And we call this the backward projection in general. So this is from a P2 space. We are going to map it into a P3 space. Let's call this particular surface on the that defines the tangent, that defines the light rays that is tangent to the surface and passes through the camera center as the contour generator. This outline here is going to be the contour generator. This literally means this particular outline here generates uh, what we call the contour of the shape on the 2D image over here. And we'll call this the projected contour of this shape onto the 2D image over here, the apparent contour, which we'll denote by uh, gamma. So this is a projective uh, camera. The, we should know by now that uh, why this is called a projective camera. The reason is because all the light rays passes through the camera center over here. And similarly for an affine camera, we can also define the same thing. But in this case here, we can see that the backward projection over here will be a light ray that is tangent to the surface as well as the camera plane. The reason is because we do not have the center of projection anymore. All the light rays are going to be parallel to each other here. But this still doesn't stop us from defining the contour generator as well as the apparent contour. So the apparent contour is also called the outline or a profile of the shape that is being projected onto the 2D image. And we have seen that uh, the contour generator, it actually only depends on the relative position of the camera center and surface, and it doesn't depend on the image plane. It's pretty obvious here. 
So when we define the contour generator, we're looking at this outline over here. This is what we call the contour generator on the 3D shape. And this particular contour generator here, we have defined earlier on that this has to be the tangent of this light ray that is tangent on the surface and it must also pass us through the camera center over here. So as a result, we can just simply define this set of light rays that starts from the camera center and passes through every tangent of the 3D shape. And this set of light rays defines what we call the contour generator. It's pretty obvious from here that it has nothing got to do with the image plane. So the image plane plays no role in defining the contour uh, generator. And but on the other hand, the apparent contour on the image is actually defined by the intersection of image plane uh, with the rays to the contour generator. And it actually does depend on the position of the image plane because we can see over here is that this is the apparent contour that we denote by gamma over here. So since we know that this is the contour generator and this contour generator is defined by a set of light rays that passes through the camera center as well as the 3D shape surface. Depending on uh, where we place this camera image plane, we can see that the section of the light ray on, and the camera image plane would be different every time uh, depending on the location of the uh, particular image plane. Hence, we, we will say that the apparent contour which is the projection of the contour generator in of the 3D shape onto the 2D image. It does depend on the position of the image plane. So now let us define the forward projection of a quadric under the camera matrix projection P, uh, which onto the image, and this would become a conic. We'll use a dual conic or a line conic to define uh, the forward projection of the quadric. And this is given by C star equals to P Q star uh, P transpose. The reason why we use the dual conic or the line conic is because we know that each one of this line that is tangent to the conic, it back projects to a plane. And this particular plane over here would also be the tangent that defines the quadric in the P3 space. And here's the proof of this expression. Uh, we know that uh, in lecture one, the line that is tangent to the conic outline satisfy this equation, L transpose C star L equals to zero. And we also seen earlier that lines from the image back project to a plane uh, given by pi equals to P transpose L that are tangent to the quadric and thus it satisfy this quadric equation pi transpose q star pi equals to zero. Then uh, by simply substituting the equation of the uh, plane pi over here given by p transpose l into these two entities over here, we will get this expression l transpose p q star p transpose l where we can simply group this p q star p transpose into C star over here, uh, which satisfy the first equation over here. And as a result, we can see that C star is actually equals to P of Q star uh, and P transpose. And this becomes the projection of the quadric onto an image, which gives a conic. Now, having a look at the, the action of the camera projection on uh, several geometric entities, uh, such as the point, plane, line, conics, and quadrics. Let's move on to look at the effect of uh, changing the parameters within the camera intrinsics as well as the extrinsics value uh, on, on the projection of the 3D entities onto the 2D image. Uh, we know that uh, any object in the 3D, for example, this 3D shape of a house, the outline of a house over here, uh, we know that any object uh, in 3D space and the cam camera center defines a set of light rays because light travels is in, in straight line. So what it means is that suppose that we have a 3D shape here, any point on the 3D shape which we define as X, a light from the sun, for example, a source, it's going to be reflected in straight line and they are all going to converge at a single center of conversion, which is the camera center. 
and an image is obtained by the intersection of every one of these light ray uh, with a image plane. So see here the camera center and the, the orientation of the image plane. So essentially this defines the rotation and the translation of the camera. This is the extreme six of the camera. And we can see quite obviously here that if we were to change the camera center from this point to suppose this point, fixing the orientation of our image plane, the light rays are going to move in a different direction. And hence, uh, the projection onto the image is going to change despite the fact that our camera orientation as well as the 3D object remains fixed. We can also see that if the camera center remains fixed, if we were to change the orientation of the image over here, we can see that the, the projection is also going to be uh, different from uh, the, the previous one because the intersection of the light ray with the image plane it's going to change as well as uh, we can see that th this length over here define how far the image plane is from the camera center is what we call the focal length so if we were to change this focal length uh, we can also pretty much see that from here if you have a focal length f1 and the projection and uh, in comparison to this image plane over here if we have a uh, denote this focal length as f2 the projection onto the image is going to uh, stay pretty much uh, different. So uh, what we are going to look at now is that uh, how to formulate this in a more mathematical uh, way. We are going to look at how the projection onto the image by a 3D entity is going to change if we were to change the uh, intrinsics or if we were to vary the intrinsics as well as the uh, uh, extrinsics value of the camera. We have seen earlier on from the illustration that the image obtained from the same camera, it may be mapped onto another by a projective plane transformation, uh, which is called the homography. The reason is because they are all passing through the same light ray. For example, this point over here, it's passing through the same light ray and this converges at the camera center. And uh, we have seen earlier on, if uh, the projection is onto a plane, that means that uh, with the same camera center, that means that there is a relation between these two points. Uh, and this is actually related by a homography. So I, we will have hx equals to x prime. In other words, we can say that uh, this is projective equivalent. So there will be a same set of uh, projective uh, properties. And hence, a camera can also be thought of a projective uh, imaging device. Uh, we, can, we will see that this can be used to measure the projective properties of the cone of ray with the uh, vertex of the camera center. Let's try to formulate this relation mathematically. Suppose that we uh, we are given two images, I and I prime, with the same camera center. So this means that the camera center stays fixed, which is illustrated by this uh, diagram over here. We'll just look at the change of maybe uh, focal length or orientation of the camera. Uh, and so what this means is that the light ray for the same point is going to converge to the uh, same camera center because the camera center stays fixed. And uh, here, let's denote uh, the first image that we have seen here as, uh, let's say this image here as I prime and this image here as I with the same camera center. We, we, we also further denote the two camera matrix as P as, and P prime over here, where the camera center uh, remains the same this is the only thing that stays fixed. We can bring this guy here, uh, K and R over here to this side of the equation, uh, making this uh, side of the equation I and minus C tilde uh, the subject. So uh, since K and R, they are both three by three uh, matrices. So R is an octagonal matrix, uh, which the inverse equals to the transpose. Uh, the, the multiplication of these two three by three matrices are also going to be a uh, full rank uh, three by three uh, matrix. So we can take the inverse and bring it over to P. Hence we get the I and minus C tilde the subject. So we can substitute this, uh, substitute this guy over here as KR inverse multiplied by P. Hence, uh, we will get this equation that relates the camera projection matrix of P prime and P with basically the intrinsic value and the orientation of the camera. Since the 
camera center remains the same. And now let's further look at the the effect of this expression over here on on a three D. Uh, point that is denoted by x. Suppose that I'm going to do a forward projection of this particular 3D point onto the image of i prime. Uh, the end effect would be p prime multiplied by x over here. And now let's uh, substitute this guy uh, uh, into p prime, and we will see that we will get this uh, equation over here, which uh, consists of the intrinsics and the rotation of both cameras as well as the projection matrix of the first camera p and since well, we know that p multiplied by x is going to be a 3d point here it's going to be a forward projection onto the image by the camera matrix p here and we denote this by small x so this would be the essentially the relation hence we'll get this relation where x prime is equals to k prime r prime multiplied by kr inverse uh, multiplied by x. We, we can see also that uh, since this here becomes a 3 by 1 homogeneous matrix x prime, and on the right hand side, we also get the 3 by 1 homogeneous uh, vector of x. So this simply means that we are now in the same projective space, uh, which is the P2 space, and x and x prime would be simply related by a homography that means that k prime r prime multiplied by k r inverse they are simply a uh, homography by the way there's a missing prime over here so we should rewrite it as x prime equals to h multiplied by uh, x where h is simply given by oh there's also a missing prime over here so uh, where h is simply given by k prime r prime multiplied by k r uh, inverse uh, previously, we have looked at the effect of a, a fixed camera center. So essentially, that ended up to be a homography that relates two points at the change of the intrinsics as well as the uh, rotation of the camera. Let's suppose that everything else in the camera matrix stays fixed. The only thing that we are going to change here would be the focal length in our camera matrix. So suppose that uh, we have a camera matrix that's given by f, uh, it could be fx or fy, but let's uh, the, make the illustration simpler. Suppose that we have, uh, the, there's no skew, that means that we have a uniform uh, focal length over the x and y axis. So suppose that we are only going to change this particular parameter in our camera matrix, which is given by this guy over here, uh, we are going to only change the focal length inside here and everything else uh, remains the same. We'll see that this corresponds to the displacement of an image along the principal axis where the effect on the image is simply uh, image magnification. So we, this, this can be intuitively observed if we look at it uh, geometrically. Suppose this is our camera uh, center, C over here, and this is our image plane. So we, we have seen earlier on that the intersection of the image plane with the principal axis is the, the length between this camera center and to the intersection of the principal axis and the image plane, which is called the principal point. Uh, it's defined by the focal length. So if we were to move this plane in and out, we can see that basically a point here, it's going to get magnified. So if the, this is the location over here, if I were to move it out over here, then the basically the relative distance, let's say if I have two points over here, I have two points x1 and x2 over here. So we can see that uh, the relative distance between these two points and the relative distance between these two points, after an increase of focal length, it's going to be increased as well. Hence, this is equivalent to a magnification of the uh, forward projected object uh, on the 2D image. Let's now look at how to formulate this uh, mathematically. Suppose that we have the two image points of the same 3D point x, which we denote by x and x prime over here before and after uh, zooming. So uh, x before zooming would be equals to x uh, equals to k uh, identity 0 multiplied by x. So this uh, we are we are looking at the canonical uh, uh, representation of a camera projection matrix where the world frame is aligned with the camera frame. 
this is our intrinsics, this is our extrinsics, and this whole thing here is actually P uh, multiplied by X, and this is the projection into the image. And after magnification, let's denote it by X prime equals to K prime. So in this case here, uh, it's only the focal length that is changed. So we are changing the focal length from F to F prime, for example. We'll denote this as the change in our intrinsics uh, value. Uh, at a canonical frame, whether the uh, principal point uh, is, is constant at uh, maybe px, py, or maybe uh, at zero, it doesn't matter over here. So this is here, the intrinsic and extrinsic here denote p prime, multiplied by the same point, because this is the projection of that same point onto the two images before and after magnification. What we want to do here is that we want to bring this guy into this equation. So uh, we will apply this particular trick over here. Since we know k inverse multiplied by k over here equals identity, it has no effect. So we'll add a k inverse over here and we'll bring this guy here, this uh, p matrix here directly here because uh, these two are going to cancel off. And uh, effectively, we are going to uh, result to the same equation as x prime that we have seen earlier on. So now let's evaluate this guy over here. So since we have uh, this k uh, prime multiplied by k inverse, we will let it remain over here, but we will look at this effect over here. So this particular effect over here is simply uh, p, the original projection matrix before magnification multiplied by x, and this is equivalent to the projection of the 3D point into the 2D image. And hence, we get this particular relation over here. As a result of this uh, operation over here, by uh, simply magnifying the focal length over here, we can see that uh, this resulted in another homography where x prime is actually equals to k prime k inverse x, where this on the left and right hand side, these are all three by one uh, homogeneous coordinate. This means that we are uh, doing a P2 space mapping into a P2 space as well. Hence, uh, K prime K inverse here must be equals to a homography, uh, which gives this uh, same form of relation that we have seen earlier on. So this X prime equals to H multiplied by uh, X, where H over here is simply K prime multiplied by K inverse. Uh, just now we saw the general form of uh, representing the change in the focal length uh, as k and uh, into the intrinsic value. Uh, now let's be more explicit uh, about this. If the focal length uh, is the only thing that differs within k, so we are not talking about the principal point. We say that the principal point here uh, remains the same. So we can uh, further evaluate this term, which is our homography that we have looked at earlier on as this particular form here. Suppose we denote the magnification factor as this small k over here, it's going to be equals to f prime, which is our new focal length after magnification, divided by the original focal length. Uh, by evaluating this, if we have f prime 1 and then x 0, so uh, y 0 over here, which is the principal point, and then we have uh, k, the original k, which is f over here, and x 0, y0, zero, the principal point remains the same. If we were to work this out, this is the form that we will get, where small k equals to f prime over f, and that's the magnification uh, factor. If we were to express this particular equation over here in terms um, of making k prime the subject, so th this simply means that we are going to bring k inverse uh, over to this side. Uh, which becomes a multiplication with k, uh, the metric multiplication here can be further uh, evaluated into uh, k multiplied by the original uh, focal length of the camera. So if we were to represent this as k, where a here is simply uh, the diagonal of the original uh, focal length, we can see that uh, this after multiplication into here, because uh, this 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 is going to become uh, simply k multiplied by a, where this guy here has no effect on this because we can see uh, from the multiplication is that uh, ki multiplied by x tilde that's going to give us k multiplied by this x tilde over here, and then uh, plus one minus k x tilde where this can be further evaluated as plus x 
tilde minus kx tilde where this guy here cancels off and this is simply x0 we can simply rewrite this as x0 and hence as a result of this form of uh, expression over here we can see that the change from k to k prime would be simply a magnification factor on k itself now let's move on to look at the effects on the images by pure camera rotation. What this means is that we are going to uh, assume that all other uh, intrinsics and extrinsics parameters in the camera matrix remains the same, except for the only change would be our uh, camera rotation. Let's denote the 2D projection uh, of the same 3D point X x and x prime on two images so in this illustration the only uh, change here is the rotation between any two camera frames image one and image two and uh, we are going to look at the same 3d point that project onto uh, x and x prime on the first and second uh, image we will denote this projection as before as uh, x equals to k uh, multiply by identity zero so this is the canonical uh, representation of our camera projection of the same 3d point x and then this same 3d point is going to forward projected onto the second image which we denote as uh, x prime over here equals to uh, k multiplied by r so the only difference here is that there is a rotation because we are rotating this camera by an amount of r over here and multiplied by the same 3d point over here now we're going to uh, put this guy over here this guy over here into this the second equation over here and we are going to apply the same tricks as before so uh, notice that k inverse k here is going to be identity so this by simply inserting this guy k inverse over here it allows us to bring this canonical representation of the camera projection p over here uh, into the second equation and we'll get k inverse k multiplied by the identity uh, 3 by 4 uh, matrix over here this term over here and see that this essentially is equal to the first camera projection multiplied by x which is simply equals to the projection of this 3d point onto the first image which we denote as uh, small x over here hence we uh, what we have obtained here would be similar as the first two cases where uh, we have seen that uh, uh, we have uh, re uh, obtained this relation small x prime equals to k r k inverse uh, small x and this is essentially equals to a p2 space projected onto a p2 space where uh, this term over here is simply a 3 by 3 homography so we'll get the same form of expression x prime equals to hx where h here now equals to k multiplied by r k inverse or we can see that it's a function of the uh, rotation matrix and here's some properties of this rotation the homography uh, is also commonly uh, called in the literature as conjugate uh, rotation so what's interesting about this is that uh, because this is an upper triangular uh, matrix and the k uh, and if we take k multiplied by r which is an octagonal matrix multiplied by k inverse the end result of the homography the eigenvalues of this homography would have the same eigenvalue as the rotation matrix up to a certain scale uh, mu so uh, there will be three eigen values of this homography and, and the rotation matrix since this is a three by three uh, matrix we'll see that the eigenvalue of h would be the same as the eigenvalues of r so what's interesting here is that if we have two images that undergoes pure rotation only we can actually observe four corresponding points from these two images from this four corresponding point we can compute the homography and from the homography we can actually apply an eigenvalue operation on this homography to get the three eigenvalues over here since the eigenvalues of the homography is equivalent to the eigenvalue of the rotation and what's even more interesting here is that we'll see that the eigenvalue here uh, it shares the same common scale so we can normalize this we can eliminate the scale over here and what's essentially going to left over would be the first entry here is one the second is e to a power of i is defined as an Euler angle a complex number e to a power of minus i theta and we can see that theta here 
it's actually our rotation angles in the rotation matrix. So what's uh, interesting here is that if we have this pure rotation in one dimensional uh, uh, rotation, we can pretty much find the homography first and then take the eigenvalues of the homography, which allows us to solve for the change in angle uh, that corresponds to the rotation uh, matrix. What this means is that under pure rotation, by using four point correspondences, between two images under pure rotation, we can actually compute H, which will give us the rotation. Now, the last case that we are going to briefly talk about, we will not look at this uh, in detail in this lecture. Uh, we'll look at a lot of detail in the next lecture when we look at the fundamental matrix and the uh, essential matrix, and as well as the epipolar geometry. So in this case here, we will look at the, uh, the scenario when the camera center is changed. So uh, previously we look at the intrinsic value, if there's a change in the intrinsic value, and if there's a change in rotation, as well as the fixed camera center and where all the rest K and R changes. Uh, in the last case here would be if there is a change in our camera center. So what's interesting about this case here is that comparing it with the previous three cases, uh, if we were to change K or change R independently or both at the same time, we cannot tell anything about the 3D structure. The reason is because uh, what we have seen in the, all these three cases here is that the relation is going to be on a P2 space. This means that it's going to be related by a homography and everything that uh, relates the two images before and after the change in these values, the K uh, intrinsic value as well as the rotation, it's going to be only given by the image points. So hence, there's no information about the 3D structure that can be obtained from this uh, zooming and pure uh, rotation cases with a fixed camera center. But things would be different if we were to uh, move the camera center. This means that, let's say, if I have two images here, uh, the first image is at can send camera center C, and the se second image undergoes a rotation and translation, for example. Let's make the scenario simple, where there's a fixed K, and this is going to rotate and translate to C prime and uh, R prime. Even if R stays the same, this is going to uh, also undergo a, a motion parallax. But uh, So let's make the scenario uh, even more uh, simpler to, to understand now. Let's say R also remains the same. The, the only thing that changed over here is our camera center C to C prime. We can see that now the relation of these two points, X and X prime over here, it's going to be related by the intersection of these two rays. The light ray is going to pass through C and X on the first image. And since X and X are projection of the same 3D point, which we denote a capital X over here. So uh, with a change of the camera center, we can see that this particular 3D point is going to project onto the second camera center uh, on the image plane over here that causes small X prime to be observed over here. So now, the relation between these two, X and X prime, is no longer simply a homography because this, in addition to being dependent on the camera center, the change, the, the two camera centers over here, it's also going to be dependent on the scene, uh, 3D point in the scene. So, so you, we can see this from another uh, 3D point here. Suppose that if I move this 3D point, the depth of this 3D point further down on the same light ray, although X2 here is going to be projected onto the same uh, image point in the first camera, we can see pretty much that uh, because of this change in the, in the 3D structure where all the camera intrinsics and extrinsics remains the same, uh, this 3D point, the new 3D point is going to be, be projected onto a new 2D point on the new camera center. Hence, uh, in conclusion, we can conclude that by changing the camera center, the observations on the two image before and after transformation by the camera center, it's going to tell us something about the 3D point as well as the uh, camera motion. So we'll look at this in more detail, uh, actually, in the rest of the remaining lectures in this semester. Basically, given a set of correspondences on the two images, how to solve for the uh, change in the rotation and translation, as well as how to recover 
the 3D structure. And this is what we call the structure from motion.